1999, an interview with Clifford Fitzsimmons, um, a Vietnam veteran. Interviewer is Leslie Zimmerman. Cliff, would you tell me just a little bit um, about your your background, your family background, where you're from? I was born and raised in a small rural community in Pomeroy, Washington. It's a cattle and wheat ranch area. Uh, I, my father was a rancher, and uh, I grew up there, went to high school at Pomeroy High School, was active in sports and uh, Future Farmers of America activities. And uh, upon graduation from high school, went to college at Lewis and Clark College, a Christian college in Portland, Oregon. Uh, during my first semester there while playing football, I broke my leg and did not finish that semester. Had, was not able to enroll to go back at the next semester because it happened in November and the next semester started in January and I still had to cast on so I didn't enroll. And rather than uh, wait for a draft notice to come, I just went ahead and enlisted in the service and they told me after my cast was off I could go, this would be in April. And I think my date of enlistment was actually April 4th. Of 19... 1965. Okay. All right. Um, what was it like, you know, growing up in the, in the country and, and that kind of thing? You have a good relationship with your family, brothers oh, yes. and sisters? Very close, tight knit family. Uh, I had uh, five brothers and sisters. I had a twin sister that died when we were 12. She had chronic asthmatic condition and just couldn't survive. Her heart finally gave out. But we, we did a lot of things together because we lived so far from town and it was a small community. Uh, in the beginning there was only, or at the time of my growing up, there was only 3,000 people in the whole county. Wow. And the average size ranch in that area is over 2,000 acres. So there was distance between people and so you got to share everything with your family. Right. You didn't have like neighbors staring down your door. <laughs> you know, our closest neighbor was a mile and a half away and he was a hired man. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Um, where's your family now? Are they still up there? Yes, all my family lives in that northwest area within probably a hundred miles of the ranch. So what are you doing in Tennessee? I came to Tennessee after I got out of the service to go to school with some fellows that I had been in the service with. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm just wondering how you got here. Um, when you enlisted, you enlisted into the Air Force, that was, um, you know, why did you choose the Air Force? My father had been a bomber pilot from World War II and encouraged me to go into the Air Force. And that seemed like a reasonable thing to me, so I went down. Better than getting drafted into the Army. Right. <laughs> and that was my father's concern, is that he didn't want me to be a grunt. Okay. All right. Well, um, my, my father's concern was that he didn't want me to be a, a combat soldier, he wanted me to go into the Air Force and get into something. I tested, and at that time, I, I came out with like 90 on each classification. I could have gone into the field with my shoulders. And what did you choose? Did you have like a guarantee? Um, or Yeah, you did, could choose. Did they tell you? On your investment, you could choose. Yeah, I wanted electronics. Okay. So I chose electronics, and they sent me after my six weeks of basic training at Lackland, Texas. Uh, boot camp and sent me to Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi to become a radio operator and maintainer. Okay. I had a dual AFSC as an operator maintainer rather than just one of the other. What was um, boot camp like? You said it was at Lackland? Yeah, it was at Lackland San Antonio? Air Force Base. It was, it didn't bother me because my father was very strict. Now a lot of the kids that weren't used to good discipline in the home had a problem with it. Uh, they didn't deal with it well, but it was no problem to me. I was used to saying yes sir, no sir. <laughs> well, well, you know, you, you hear things about getting just ripped apart by your drill sergeants and, and that kind of thing. Was it, did that go on? Yeah, it did, and, and, and it didn't, to me, uh, it didn't happen directly that I got any direct dress down other than, you know, the normal thing that was addressed to the whole group that we were a bunch of idiots and whatnot. <laughs> 
but the, the person who was selected as our dorm chief uh, and three other fellows shaved their heads during prior to the haircut day and therefore uh, he got replaced he'd only been the dorm chief for like one day or two days <laughs> and they replaced him with me so I was a dorm chief which is kind of like uh, the student leader okay and uh, what, what did that involve well just basically that I was the go between between the the drill instructor and the recruits. recruits that were there. And I marched the troops in the absence of the drill instructor after he had instructed me on how to march them to Chow or to the other places that we might go if he wasn't going. I was a food in the Air Force. It was terrible in the it, Navy. <laughs> it, it, was, it was not good. And I think that that was on purpose. I think that they were also training cooks at Lackland. <laughs> And so the best place to train cooks is where you've got recruits, so that's where they put them. I'm sure, I don't know that for a fact, but it just seemed like the, the chow was much better after you got out of boot camp. Yeah, well, I'm guessing boot camp are probably so hungry that it doesn't matter if you're going to eat it anyway. Right. And they do change your hours, and that was something that was not hard for me to adjust to, that was hard for a lot of others, because I'd lived on a ranch and got up early to do chores before school and whatnot getting up at 3 or 3.30 in the morning didn't bother me, where a lot of the guys just could not seem to get themselves awake and get out of their rack, and the drill instructor was going over and tipping over bunks with guys in them and stuff. <laughs> that's that's not, not fun. I, mean, I remember it. Um, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't real physically demanding, just more emotional. It was not as physically demanding as I anticipated it being, really. I was in good shape, but uh, there were a few fellows that had problems with the physical requirements, but I think they would have had problems, you know, in gym class. How long was basic training at that time? At that time, they had shortened it down to six weeks because they were running so many recruits in there. Okay. And I, yeah, I think it originally had been 12 and then shortened to eight and then to six. So it wasn't a long boot camp, and it wasn't um, like we spent two days on the firing range. That was minimal of everything to get through it in that length of time. There were some people who just went straight from boot camp to Vietnam, weren't there? Or did they no. all go to other training? In, in the Air Force, they all went to other training facilities, okay. where in the other services, some of them didn't, and especially those that were going into things like the Army boot camps, where they were taught their weaponry and whatnot, where they just went straight on. Okay. But, and, and that became a, a, from what I experienced, that became a, a, an issue later on in my training, is the lack of some of the trainings that were required just to go straight on and on. Mm -hmm. And so where did you go after your basic training? To Keesler Air Force Base, Mississippi, Mississippi. on the Gulf Coast. And it was a resort town in Biloxi, Mississippi. Now this is training for your electronics? Electronics operations, radio operations and maintenance is what it was called. And how long was that supposed to be? If, if you went on the accelerated class, which I did, you could go in 20 weeks. Uh, if you didn't go on accelerated, it was 30 weeks. Okay. And I went on the accelerated shift and I guess that's through testing or something that they put you in that. I don't know how they decided who gets to go accelerated or not. We did have two weeks of personnel awaiting training where we did testing and whatnot before mm -hmm. we started classes and maybe that's where they decided who went on what ships. I don't recall being told that, you know, why. I just was told that this is an accelerated shift and we went through the school in 20 weeks. And that was just purely training in the specialty that you were in. Right. There was no combat, no arms training, none of that. It was, was it was eight hours a day, five days a week, and uh, of course there were other in duties inside the squadron, the training squadron that you were in as far as care of your barracks and whatnot. And I became a, what they call a rope there. A rope? Yeah. R-O-P-E? R-O-P-E. You started as a green rope, which meant you had charge of a flight and within the flight there was your shift and there was usually 
a couple of yellow ropes where there were three flights, there would usually be two yellow ropes, and then there was a red rope over the whole ship. And I was a green rope for a while, and then a yellow rope. And was up next to the red rope when I finished school. So okay. I wouldn't have become a red rope. Of course, some of those people who were in longer classes would, would, would go on to that. <clears throat> So I was, and now that I think back, I guess I was experiencing some leadership training at that time because I had gone from being a dorm chief in boot camp to becoming a rope right? and then a higher rank rope. And I, I think that's something that they, they select who they do those things by people who have shown or demonstrated some form of sure. leadership. Sure. But you never think about why they do it. They just say, it seems you're going to be a green rope. Yeah, well, you're they, have, in they have of reasons, though. They watch and they see who, who exhibits the characteristics of leadership. Well, them. I'm sure there's something put on your, and on your service records. record when and you're yeah. in boot camp that tells these people this guy was an, an accomplished dorm chief mm -hmm. or whatever. They, you know, they give them those reasons to select you. Yeah. But you don't think about those things when you're that young and inexperienced in what the service is like. You just Somebody says, do something, you Did do you it. do it. <laughs> what was um, Miss, the Gulf Coast like down there? But that was fun. That was fun. And, and, and the were weekends fans? were good. You know, you went out and you, you tried to drink beer even though you were underage. And you had a good time. And you met lots of girls on the beach. And you, uh, you were away from home like a kid that just going to college. And you're still trying out your wings. And you're having a good time. And, and that was fun. I liked that part of it. And I liked the school. I, I liked what I was learning. I had a good time in, in that camp. Uh, it was not as strict, maybe because I was a rope leader, that I got a few more off-base privileges, time and whatnot, mm -hmm. that I enjoyed it so much. But I really did enjoy it there. And that was, uh, and I was, when my 20 weeks was over and I was done, or whatever it was, I think it was actually 22, because I had been through there for two weeks in a waiting training status where they did the testing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But uh, I enjoyed it and I hated to see it coming to an end because I felt like ah, now they'll send me somewhere else. And I felt like it would probably be Vietnam as a radio operator, maintainer. Uh -huh. combination that that would be where I would go. But they offered me more training. They did, at the end of the 20 weeks? At the end of the 20 weeks, I had, uh, I remember I was taken out of the squadron, put into a personnel awaiting orders barracks, and I was in there just a day or two, and they came and asked if I would like to have more training, and uh, I said yes, certainly. Did they tell you specifically what kind of training? Or? No, but I assumed that it would be additional training there on the Gulf Coast, which was a poor <laughs> assumption. <laughs> you didn't get to stay? No. In Mississippi? I mean, yeah, Mississippi. That's where right. it was, right? Yeah. You no. Know, in three days after I had said yes, I got orders to Fort Ord, California, assigned to uh, become combat trained by the Army because the Air Force didn't have combat training schools. So they didn't tell you this before you said yes. They just said, you want more training? Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I thought it was really good. I thought I was going to get to stay on the Gulf Coast. And I, and I had... That's so fair. I had this real thought that if I went somewhere else, I'd have to go through this whole process of finding bars that would serve underage kids beer again. <laughs> <laughs> and where is Fort Ward? It's in Southern California. Well, that's not Plus, too bad, though. Yeah. No. Unless you're like stuck out in the middle of the desert somewhere. And I, and I really, uh, you know, how it is when they, they send you to a, a airport, they put you on a plane, somebody meets you and loads you on a bus with a bunch of other guys coming from other places, and they take you to a base, and you never really see the town until you get out of there. Well, I, in the Army training thing, we didn't get out of there. And the whole time you were at Fort Ord? Uh -uh. We were there for a short few weeks of combat training because the Air Force didn't have any. They had arranged with the Army to train us. And we were basically, I think we had one weekend for one night pass or something. I don't think we got out of there but one night. So why do you think that you were chosen to do that 
additional type of training? I mean, especially since... I think they offered it to quite a few, and they were looking for all volunteers, and I don't know that they were any of them chosen except for their field. They had to have certain specialties. Okay. Because we came from a variety of different specialties. Some of them were radio, some of them were maps people, some of them were uh, intelligence people, some of them were language people, and they came from all different... How, how did you feel about All different AFSCs is what they call them, Air Force Specialty okay. Codes. How did you feel about, about volunteering for something that you had no idea what was... Well, I told them I didn't think this you. was what was going to, what I was volunteering for, and they said I should have asked the questions before I said yes. <laughs> Rule number one: <laughs> Don't ask volunteer beforehand. And don't volunteer. <laughs> when when that was over, that two weeks was over, I felt uh, like I would be headed for Vietnam right away. Okay. But then we were we all who were there received orders to Fort Polk, Louisiana. And then we were greeted there by an Air Force colonel who informed us that we were there to become the first Special Forces unit in the United States Air Force. Wow. And they, we were being trained by the Army because the Air Force did not have the personnel to do the training, but in the future, some of us would be back to do training of troops following us. How much did he explain to you at that time what Special Forces was? Because he did, he did a, he did a lot, lot and there was some Army people, and then the briefing was probably an hour long of what we were going to be faced with, and by that time they had a pretty full plan of, of what we would be going through as far as the training. It would be basically the same thing that the Green Berets were going through. Uh, we would be going in reverse of some of the things that those guys had already been to jump school. We hadn't. Mm -hmm. So they had to find time during this time to take us to jump school. And that was done uh, along with the, a little more weapons familiarity of the different types of weapons that we had seen and just barely got to touch at Fort Ord. They started us out a little differently probably than they did the other troops, but it was uh, designed that way because they didn't have the we didn't have the same background as some of those people did as far as getting prepared to go through this school. Mm -hmm. And by the time they finished the briefing and the next day, we, we were put under Army commanders or training instructors, as they were called, drill instructors in the Army, training instructors in the Air Force, but the same thing. And we were probably the scariest bunch of kids you ever saw. <laughs> And most of them were how, about how old? <coughs> 18, 19? Most of them 18, 19 years old. Uh, I don't think there was anybody older than 21. And, and I think there was only one that was actually 21. Mm -hmm. The rest of us were all 18, 19. And we were all uh, pretty frightened of being put in this position because we went into the Air Force to avoid this position, probably. Right. I'm sure that probably was in the, at least in the back of everybody's mind. But by the time we got through the first probably two months, they had brainwashed us to believe that we were going to be superhuman beings. And what, what, what kind of things did they do um, to brainwash? Well, they just, first of all, they started with physical conditioning and they, and they started whipping us into a physical conditioning program that matched what the Army boys had gotten through boot camp that we didn't get that quality or quantity of physical conditioning in the Air Force. Mm. And our physical conditioning was improved drastically. Our uh, falling into the pattern of <clears throat> early rising, working hard, and constantly singing songs telling us what badasses we were going to be. <laughs> and we believed it. Did, was there a lot of verbal abuse? Yeah, but that was part of it. You, you tear people down in that situation so that they learn to follow orders. And it was more important even in that type of training than it was in the regular Air Force boot camp learning to follow orders thing 
because now people's lives are directly dependent upon somebody else following orders. Right. And they made us understand that. And they did a real good job of taking some people who were basically avoiding a combat situation by their type of enlistment and changing us over to somebody who was ready for combat. Was there any physical abuse other than just the physical training, the, the, the specialized, you know, more... more no, there, <clears throat> there wasn't any physical abuse as far as... Uh, other than the instructor teaching you, like, there were different instructors for different parts, but the guy that was teaching you hand-to-hand -hand combat didn't care to knock you on your ass <laughs> <laughs> to prove to you that he knew how to do it and he was going to show you how. Okay. And it might hurt, but you can get over the hurt. Yeah. But it wasn't abuse just to be abusive. It, it was, There was a little of it, but it was more... It was more because we were Air Force in a, on an Army camp. Okay, I understand. You know, there was a lot of junior bird men, and, you know, you don't have to hit these guys hard. Just knock them down. They'll cry, you know, because they're Air Force. <laughs> what, no, what's a junior bird man? That's an Air Force man. Oh, okay. <laughs> an Air Force trainee of any sort is a junior bird man. Okay. <laughs> I've never heard that. Five years in the Air Force, never heard of called bird man. <laughs> That's what the Army called us. Okay. And I heard that same term used by some Marines who were there for some special training, too. They I'd rather be a birdman <laughs> than a jarhead. <laughs> but, yeah. But that was what they called us, junior birdmen. Yeah, okay. And by the time that training was over, I, I, I felt, and I know the others did, too, they graduated a higher percentage of us, I think, because they were forced to than what they did to the Green Berets. Really? Uh, I think we graduated like 48% uh, of those that started. You say because you think they were forced to. Why? Because Why the Air Force needed so many of us so quickly. Oh, okay. They had to say, well, you know, we're not going to kick out 65 or 75% of these guys. We need them right now. So they probably graduated a higher percentage of us than they did the Green Berets as far as how many washed out. <clears throat> and uh, we, we were at that point, uh, we'd been over to Fort Benning and gotten our jump school and we'd been through all that and the Air Force made a big deal out of graduating us. A lot of brass came in for the graduation of the first class. And they made you feel important while they were standing there with orders in their hand to send you to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, here you go, go to Vietnam. <laughs> Show us what you learned. Uh, but there was a lot of training there. I mean, we were taught things that were, in the Air Force normal people didn't receive in the, the, the survival skills, the combat skills, the uh, because they knew we were going to Vietnam, we got some language skills there, but we got some more advanced language training later. Some of the guys were already linguists, had been to the Air Force language schools. Uh, we, we got a lot of uh, intelligence type things of, I mean, skills of observation is what it really was. How to observe what was going on. How to interpret what people's movements as to what was happening. How to observe that if there was a whole bunch of people going in and out of one hut, something was going on in that hut. Mm -hmm. And where to, and different methods to identify who the leaders of certain groups were by observing them. These were the skills that we were taught as a part of our training that was to benefit us later on in what our assignments were. Did they have any training um, about the culture of the Vietnamese and why they were fighting, you know, the way they were fighting? Um, Not really about the Vietnamese, but some, yes, but they did teach us some things about the area that we were going into and the different factions of that area, the different societies within that area. Some were communist, some were not actually democratic, but somewhat democratic in there. At the age of 18, 19, how much did you really know and understand about 
what had been going on over there? Very little. They didn't teach us a lot of history of what had gone on with the French and what had gone on for hundreds of years in that area. They didn't really teach us a lot about that. They did teach us that there were different types of people within that area. In other words, you had, uh, let's say, subcultures within the area. The Munyards were a subculture. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the different ethnic, uh, polyethnic groups is what they, I think they referred to them as polyethnic groups. Politically motivated ethnic groups that separated themselves out. Okay. Uh, and they taught us about people that weren't in Vietnam, but we didn't know why they were teaching that stuff mm -hmm. until we were there. Because we had no, no idea that anybody was actually going into Cambodia and Laos until after we were there. Oh, okay. And don't forget that at this time we were all going through security clearances. Right. So some of the guys didn't actually wash out of the program, they couldn't get past the security clearance. Yeah, I'm sure that those were pretty tough. Um, I don't know. I know I filled out papers, hundreds of questions, family, friends, school teachers, and they were in my little hometown interviewing everybody. Yeah, they do. They actually go and they interview and people. I remember you know, that. They probably talk to the jackass that stands by the railroad <laughs> station all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, you went in in 65, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, things had already been pretty well underway for a while. How much um, in the way of protesting and that kind of stuff did you experience before you went over there, if anything? Like when you were in California, when you were in Mississippi, if you went out into town, was there, did you experience any animosity from the civilians? No, I mean, there's always a little animosity by the locals in any military camp city. Oh, that's just because the military are wild. <laughs> the military are wild <laughs> and so on. And, and the local guys don't like the military guys with the local girls. Sure. So on type thing. Uh, being in a resort community like Biloxi was not nearly as bad because there were a lot of out-of-town girls. Okay. They were visiting for a few days, you know, and, it, and it, they weren't looking for long-term relationships. <laughs> Neither were you, were you? <laughs> <They're> right. <laughs> they were just there to have a little fun. And believe me, in those days, there was probably as much went on. It just wasn't as openly done. Sure. sure. So after you got your orders, you graduated from um, the Army School in Fort Polk, or in the Fort Polk, mm -hmm. Louisiana. You got orders to go to Vietnam. Did you get a break at least before you went over yeah. there? Did you get some leave to go I, home? I, I could have gotten 30 days leave, but uh, I decided not to use all my leave right then. I wanted to save some for another thing. But I was dumb as to what I could and couldn't do when you went in combat them. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to leave next week, okay? Right. <laughs> and I was going to save some leave for something else when my sister got married, but, you know, I didn't realize that, you know, I couldn't just say I want some leave because I thought that you could. <laughs> yeah, well, they don't tell us. They don't, they don't you tell you. <laughs> they don't teach you everything. So then I, I took some leave, went home. My father was sorely disappointed when I got off the plane. Why? Uh, because I was wearing a beret. I was wearing a beret and he knew what that meant. Oh. He'd yeah. seen enough on TV and radio programs. So you didn't have a chance to tell him? You didn't I could have to told him. I just to didn't, him. I didn't, I didn't, I just said I was going to school. You know, I didn't go a lot into it. I, I didn't write that kind of letters. Oh. When I wrote, I wrote, you know, I'm going through training, I'm doing this, uh, that. I know I would talk about weapons training, I'd talk about it, but I didn't say I was becoming a member of special forces. Okay. Would you even have been allowed to say something like that? I don't know. I suppose so because it was, you know, people in that area knew that. I mean, the people who, the, the civilians who lived around Fort Polk knew that that's okay. what was going on there. So okay. I don't think it was a okay. military secret that we had special forces. <coughs> and it, <coughs> they did send an announcement to my local paper. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. That I had graduated from special forces 
training school and was a member of the first uh, Air Force Special Forces class to graduate. So your dad was not happy? No, he wasn't happy. He wasn't, I won't say he wasn't proud, he just wasn't happy that I... Because he knew what it meant. Right. And he asked me questions about why I would do I said, Dad, I just thought I was going to get more school. I didn't know what the hell was going on. And he said, yeah, I, he understood you can end up volunteering and not knowing what you're volunteering for. And I said, well, that's what happened. But I said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready for what I have to do now. And I, was, I really did feel like I was a pretty badass by then. <laughs> I, I really did. I, I, they made me believe that, you know, they couldn't make us bulletproof, but they could make us invisible. Make you invisible, yeah. I, I wonder how many people um, actually volunteered without realizing what they were volunteering for. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about that, but... I think a lot did. And now, there were some people who actually went in to Army Special Forces because they chose that. They chose, they said they wanted to become a Green Girl. And, and I guess it was different for them in how they were selected. So if you, sometimes if you didn't know the right questions to ask, you, when you were volunteering, then... After you've done it once or twice, you just learn not to volunteer. <laughs> you, just <learn. laughs> you just learn not to volunteer. I guess so. I mean, that's something I hear a lot is, don't you know you're never supposed to volunteer? You know, they can come to you and say, I need three volunteers for special duty. you got to love this. Yeah, I volunteer. Okay, you're in garbage detail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you learn after a while. It just takes you a while to learn. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, when you, after you got off leave, you went straight to Vietnam, or did you have a stop for we, training somewhere else? We, we had some su jungle survival school in the Philippines for, uh, I don't remember how long it was, it was a few days, a couple of weeks maybe. Philippines? Yeah. And it was basically a continuation of some of the things we learned at Fort Polk. It was just getting us a little more acclimated to what was in those jungles in that area. Right, and it, basically, these things are edible, these things are not, you know, that type of thing as far as what we did. I mean, they didn't take us out and dump us out and say, you got to get back here in three days, you know. <laughs> they, we'd already been through that type of thing. We knew how to read maps and compasses and figure out where we were and whatnot. That was not the type of survival it was. It was here, now we've got you in this tropical climate, here is what that you can survive on and here's what you can't. And those type of things that we were learning there. And I don't remember how long it was. It seemed like it was maybe a week, maybe 10 days, I don't remember. What do you think about being put in this tropical environment all of a sudden? I mean, the heat, the... That didn't really bother me. Bugs, the snakes, the... <laughs> I, you know, I expected it. You know, we we all already knew enough about that area to know that we could expect that. Yeah. But you got to remember that Vietnam is not not all wet, damp jungle. There are right. highlands and whatnot, and the uh, and the areas that surround Vietnam are not all dense jungle. There are different types of terrain, like down in the south part, where I never was stationed. It was what they called the delta. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of flooded swampy areas where up in the north part where we went out it wasn't. Okay. There was some along the river basins and whatnot, but there was not as much as what there was as far as swamp. But it was all hot and it was all don't get me wrong, there there wasn't a lot of temperature variation. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> hot and hotter. <laughs> and it was wet damp, muggy, climate. When you got to Vietnam, you got off the plane, I said you went on a plane, uh, what was your first, what was the first impression that you had when you got off the plane over there? I think you look around wondering where the war is because there's all these people going here and there not paying attention to anything. I mean, it's just like a regular base that might be in the United States as far as what people are doing. Where did you go into? 
when, when you landed in Vietnam, where was it? We went into Cameron Bay, okay. Tonsonut area, and then we went north. But we had some briefing, what they call in-country briefing there, and then they, they sent us, my group went to an Air Force Intelligence Headquarters in the Nine area. I've heard a lot of people <coughs> say that <coughs> the, you know, one of the most vivid memories of getting off the plane was the smell. Um, you didn't have a problem with that where you landed? Because yeah, you could smell. There, there were some places that, you know, people said it was just, it was so horrendous that it would almost make you sick. It was offensive until you got used to it, then you just didn't notice it. Don't notice it. it was offensive probably for a period of a couple of days or a sure. week maybe. Other times it seemed like it was worse that you might notice it again, but it was there all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just that you got acclimated to it. You, you, you learn to acclimate yourself physically to separate out the things that are normal causes you to distract yourself. So you learn to accept what's normal and you aren't distracted by it. Therefore, you can smell a man smoking a cigarette a hundred yards away if right. you're used to the odors that are going to be normal. Right. So you got over there, what, um, you know, what, what did you start to do when you went over there? I mean, you, you didn't go through any other training once you got there, you just Briefings. took your unit? Once I was assigned to my unit, which was a second uh, Black Tiger unit, we were... Second Black Tiger? Yeah, we were called the Black Tigers. The Air Force Special Forces were called the Black Tigers. And uh, maybe because our berets were black, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, my, my briefing was by CIA and intelligence people as to what our missions were, which uh, we were to establish safe villages for downed pilots who were going to be flying missions over the north, and we were establishing safe villages in Laos and Cambodia for those people to get into if they were shot down. Now what did you, what did you do when you said establish a safe village? What, um, what did that in, involve? We would go into the village and usually we were carrying a uh, CIA person with us who we were his support. He was to talk the village leader into letting their village be a safe village. That, that was we would give person. them, yeah. That we would give them certain supplies, rice. We would give them uh, meats. We would give them some weapons to protect themselves from communist troops. We would give them a means to communicate with us by radio. If they got a down pilot, they would be told if there was a down pilot in the area to get out and try to find him and get him back. He was supposed to be trying to find them. They were supposed to try to find him and get him into their village where he could be hidden safely. And that doesn't necessarily mean he was actually in the village. He might be just outside the village being hidden. Mm -hmm. But that, 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 that they knew where he was so that we could come and get him. Okay. And some of the villages that were agreeable to doing this were actually agreeable because they were politically sympathetic to our side of the cause, and some were agreeable to doing it simply because the leader said, you will do it, the village leader said, you will do this, because he was getting paid by us okay. to see that. None of them were safe as far as we considered them actually safe. They were safe only as much as it was a place that we felt like we could make a contact and get the pilot out quickly because there was always somebody in that village who was sympathetic to the other side. Sure, I would imagine that there would be. That's what I was going to ask is how 
I mean, obviously the CIA person had some intelligence on which villages were more likely to cooperate, but you'd still think there's probably also going to be people in any village that are for the other side. Right. And that was basically why we had to get them out fast. If somebody from that village was going to tell the other side that there was an American pilot in this village, it would still take time to get that message to them and they would respond to it trying to capture that pilot. We had to be there first and get him out. Mm -hmm. And that's why we were located the way we were in quick strike teams, usually five to seven men, and located, I would be out for 12 to 14 days in a position to reach any one of three or four villages very quickly once we knew there was a down pilot in the area. Mm -hmm. And we would call in our escape to a certain LZ to get out of there with that pilot mm -hmm. a lot of times before we even had the pilot in hand. Wow. Because it took a while for the choppers to get to us. Mm -hmm. Once we were lifted, we, we had a pilot in hand, that village may never be ever used again. It would not be? It may never be. May never Most be. likely would not be, would not. but it could be. Okay. But see, once you lift one out, then they probably already know that that was a village. And the villages were rolled over. They were actually attacked by the path at Lao. And the NVR, when they were in that area, they, they would attack those villages and make them pay a heavy price for having helped us. Mm -hmm. So if we went back to that village looking for support again, we might not find it. Right. <laughs> Most likely would not. <laughs> However, if we were able to bring that pilot out quickly and nobody knew that we got him out of there, that village would say, we got another pilot down in the area. We're going to go get him because we're going to get some money out of you all. And we, we bought pilots back. Mm -hmm. We carried in as high as twenty-five thousand dollars in gold bars to bring back pilots. Oh my goodness! You carried that with you? Yes. Out in the jungle, gold bars. We didn't have it there until they told us we're going to have to buy this guy back, um, and then they would. How would you know if you would have to buy the pilot? The contact made by the villagers. See, sometimes pilots were down two or three days before they would make it to a village because they went down in the north and got across the border to Cambodia or Laos to to a safe village. Hmm. They were made to memor the pilots were made to memorize safe village locations that would be in the vicinity that they would fly. Okay. In other words, if you're flying over in this quadrant, mm -hmm. if your bomb mission and whatnot is going to put you in this quadrant, your closest safe villages are here, here, and here. Memorize these locations because they couldn't carry any information on them as to where a safe village was. Right because if they were killed and crashed and that information was on them or in their plane, so they had to just memorize these locations. Well, they go down, it might take them two or three days of moving at night and hiding during the day to get to a safe village. Mm. But if the safe village knew they were down, they would go across the border into the North Vietnam side and bring them out. Okay. And if they did this, they expected more money. Sure. And a lot of times money or just a village leader was paid in gold, where the village itself, if they were all involved, would might be paid in commodities of rice, food, mm. goods, and whatnot. Interesting. And it was up to us to get to that pilot before that any opposing forces might turn him over to the north as a POW. Sure. And they were out buying our pilots, too. The other side was. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, highest bidder. This pilot is, do I hear $2,000? <laughs> sometimes they were buying him by intimidation, and sometimes they were buying him by cash. Mm. Or food goods, or arms. Arms was a big market thing because they were sellable everywhere. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to trade in money, you could trade in arms. And believe me, our CIA did that. Did they? I can't say that I'm surprised. <laughs> <coughs> Did 
don't forget that at that time, even though that I was not aware of for some time, there was a lot of drugs moving too. <coughs> and the CIA was taking advantage of that. A lot of drugs. Did, did you have a problem with drugs at all in your unit? Uh, the one guy that I knew of in my unit, the second time I was over there, was involved in drugs. Mm -hmm. The other guys, and I, you know, myself included, you know, I tried a little of that smoke weed. <laughs> uh, it freaked me clear out. I was in Da Nang at the time, and uh, we were on a choppy chopper pad just right outside of Da Nang called Ben Tui. And I decided I'd try this shit. We were sitting on a bunker and Charlie threw, threw a few rockets in and we just sat there and laughed at him. <laughs> After smoking the stuff? After smoking the stuff. And the next day I thought how stupid I was God. that I didn't even go inside the bunker or nothing. Just sat there on top of it and laughed at Charlie. You know? <laughs> but I, I thought, you know, I don't think I'll do any more of that shit. And I never did. <laughs> Good. Good for you. <laughs> but there, there were people who I'm sure had real drug problems that I was aware of as a people, but they weren't necessarily in my outfit. The relationship that you had with people in your unit, what was it like? Like your relationship with both your peers and your superiors? The relationship was very difficult. At first you, you wanted everybody to be pals. But as you lost guys and had to replace them, you begin to feel like you didn't want to feel that way about the next guy that died. Mm. So you were close, but you were keeping a push away d distance. You didn't say, I don't want to be your friend. But you didn't actually become as close as you were with the first guys you went with. Mm. Okay. What about the, um, the officers? Did you think they were generally competent? Um, did they treat you well? Were they generally incompetent? Well, they, they were competent in the sense that they, they knew what we had to do and they were a part of it. And there were some officers who went through the same special forces training that we did. But they were not, uh, they were not as, I guess, I don't know, how do you describe it? They, they weren't as mission-oriented as we were. Mm -hmm. We were mission-oriented in the sense that we felt like that what we were doing was a difference in life and death in somebody out there. They never gave us their opinion that that's what they felt like. They felt like that we were just doing a job. Mm. I'm surprised because most of the pilots that would be down were officers, so you'd think that they would be... I, I, I know, and I know what you're saying, but it just mm -hmm. that didn't seem that way. But you got to remember that uh, most of these guys were intelligence officers. They weren't really looking at things the same way as, as, mm -hmm. as a... Mm -hmm. I mean, we were an intelligence outfit doing a job that really wasn't intelligence. We weren't just gathering intelligence. We did that. But we weren't just doing that. To me, our real mission was to be able to maintain control of a village or several villages within a certain area that we could depend on them to help us bring those pilots home. How much, if ever, did you come actually like face-to-face -face and have to do any face-to-face um, -face combat with the other side? Shooting somebody at 50 yards is not hard. No, but if they're like right up, <laughs> probably but fairly close to you. you. You try to avoid that. You try not to let them get that close to yeah, you. Yeah, I'm sure. But if it happens, and it does, you tend to change how you feel about what you're doing in the sense of when you're killing somebody. I. The man that stuck his knife through my arm right there, he he died right face to face with me. Oh. 
And I, it changed how I felt about when somebody dies. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to look at a dead body that's already dead, but it's another thing to see them die. And that changed a little bit about how you feel about it. It doesn't change the fact that you're killing somebody. It's just that they tend to have more of a face once you kill somebody up close. Mm -hmm. they, they tend to become more human. Did you have to do that very, very often? Only twice. twice. Did I ever actually kill somebody that close? I tried to avoid that as much as possible. You kill them before they get close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so your first time there, you were there for how long? Were you there for a full year? Yeah. Full year the first time. Doing this same thing, doing the safe villages and <clears throat> stuff. That was all I did in the first time that I was there was the safe village students. Then. Um, you came back to the States? Yeah, then I came, I rotated back, and I had been promoted to staff sergeant, uh, E5. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Fort Polk as a training instructor, as they told us that some of us would. So you're training new recruits? New Air Force recruits. We're using the Army facilities, but we're training Air Force recruits. Mm -hmm and they don't have to put up with being called Junior Burden by, <laughs> by the drill instructors. Okay. Uh, and we are no longer basically under any Army command at that point. We, we are using their facilities, we're sharing facilities with them as far as the barracks and the obstacle courses and the classrooms and whatnot. And our guys are going to some of the same classes with Army instructors, but the actual training instructor in charge of that group is Air Force and the Air Force is providing some of the classroom people. So that's what you were supposed to do is train? Right. I was in charge of a group of trainees and you are then somewhat responsible for who makes it through school and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And you try to give them the benefit of your experience. And I was not good at that. <laughs> and after a few months, I knocked a troop on his ass and I got busted back to an E4. <laughs> you, you knocked somebody who was somebody you were supposed to be training? Yes. <laughs> he had a smart attitude. Like he, he had already been through enough training when I got there to believe that he was kind of a badass and he didn't realize that he wasn't ready yet for what he was going to face. And I tried to get the point through and he ran his mouth too much and instead of, he would have been a person who might have gotten somebody killed by not following orders, mm -hmm. thinking he was smarter than the rest. Mm -hmm. And I had to do something to get this boy to realize that he could cause somebody else's death by his stupidity, so I ended up putting him on his butt. <laughs> and because that's technically illegal, I got busted. <laughs> so you went from an E5 down to an E4? Yeah. Lucky you only lost one rank. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I just lost one. And they asked me for reasons why, and I, I told them reasons why. And then they informed me that, that my commander informed me that uh, he was going to have to give take a stripe away in order to keep me from being court-martialed. <laughs> and uh, if I was agreeable to that, uh, he would see that that's as far as it went. And I said, okay, do it, and uh, send me back to Vietnam. So you asked the second time to go back? Yeah. Why? I felt like that if these pricks that I was trying to teach in this school were what we were going to be sending over there, I better get over there first <laughs> and see if I could save a few butts before they got there. Get over there and stop the war before the rest of them come over. And at that time, it did not occur to me that at one time I was that, that dumb and naive. Yeah. I did, it didn't occur to me that I, I had been like them. What occurred to me was that I didn't think those guys would ever be prepared for what they were going to face. Mm -hmm. And I thought, it's better for me to go over there. I can survive this. I know what's going on over there. They don't. And not that my going would stop any of them from going when they were through training, but more that I felt like that I could do something that they couldn't do there. Mm -hmm. 
it would take them too long to learn a lesson and too many of them would die trying to learn that lesson. Because mm. once you've been through enough to survive, you've, you've lost a lot of your numbers already. Yeah, yeah, sure. So when you went back, um, did you go back with the same basic unit or doing no, the I same was, job? I was in with the first Black Tiger unit instead of the second, and uh, my mission was changed. I was in more of an intelligence capacity. I was still in Cambodia and Laos most of the time. I uh, went into North Vietnam several times. Uh, we were locating supplies going up and down the trail and calling in bomb strikes. It was a little different type of situation in than that. We had to observe what damage was done and decide if there was another strike to be made. Mm -hmm. And that left us in the area fairly close to where the bombing was going on. Certainly we tried to make sure that the pilots didn't put it on us. But it also left us vulnerable because they know the bomb strikes were being put there because somebody was observing what was going on. Mm. So they're out hunting for you. And it was smaller teams, three to five men. And it was much more strenuous mentally and physically because you were a lot of times under pursuit, being pursued, trying to get to an LZ to get the hell out of there, or trying to get to a place where they had lost you and couldn't find you, and that was very difficult to do. They were better at what they were doing in their own jungle than we were. Sure. So most of the time it was trying to get to an LZ where you could get out. And that meant get far enough ahead of any pursuit to get a chopper in. Mm -hmm. And that was difficult. And we lost a higher percentage of our people in that type of work than we did in the other mm. in the turning down pilots. When um, were you there again the second time for a full year? Or? No, I was there for about eight months. Eight months. And. Uh, uh, we were on our way upriver. We had been back to Bentui and debriefed, spent a couple of days uh, there, and we're going back upriver to be dropped again. And we had uh, our chopper, there was two choppers going up, two choppers, loads of us, and uh, our chopper was hit by a uh, handheld surface to air missile rocket actually mm -hmm. and uh, it started spinning it was going down we were over the river my attempt was to jump into the river mm -hmm. but the spinning motion threw me out to the river bank yeah. and I lit in the river bank and the impact was enough to uh, cause me to have a what they call a compression fracture in my back and I was partially paralyzed. Uh, the second chopper hit the, didn't, didn't go down, it, it actually landed on the river bank and picked up those of us who survived. Uh, two out of the nine on that chopper survived. Only two. Yeah, and uh, they got us out and uh, I was taken to the third field hospital and from there I was air back to Japan. They did a surgery on me in Japan. It was minor surgery just to try to relieve the pressure that was causing part of the paralysis was from the swelling and or not from the fracture. Mm -hmm. And they immobilized my back and uh, put me on a, I don't know, I always call it a wheel bed. It was a bed that had a big wheel thing over the top oh, so they could those. stand me up. Yeah, I've seen those before. I was strapped to a board, but they could stand me up mm -hmm. on, on this thing. 
and they put me on that and put me on another airbag plane and brought me to Walter Reed. And that's in Texas, it's right? It's in Maryland. Oh, Walter Reed in Maryland, okay. <clears throat> and I was there for 13 months. At Walter Reed, uh -huh. recovering? Recovering. And then they told me I was no longer fit for military service and discharged me. And uh, I really had intended to stay. I had already re-upped uh -huh. and had intended to stay. And so this was, by then, what, what was the year? When you finally, when I when finally you, got out was 69. 69, okay. So you were but I had already re-upped. Uh, my, re my first enlistment still had time left on when I re-upped. Mm -hmm. You could do that then, and you got a little bonus for doing it. Mm -hmm. So um, when you finally got out of the hospital, where did you go? Go home? First, I went home for a few weeks. I had, had been visited while I was at the hospital by some friends of mine who had gotten out of service prior to my time. And they were going to school at the University of Tennessee, and they came to visit me up there and said, man, when you get out, why don't you come down to UT? You know? <laughs> go to school. Big yeah. lunch. <laughs> And that was really my intent, was to come down here to go to school and then maybe go back home or something. I didn't know what I was going to do at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but I came here, and uh, they were renting a house over off Kingston Pike. And I went to uh, enrolled in school. I had already sent my application in before I was ever discharged from the hospital and the service and whatnot. And uh, had been accepted and all that, and started to go to school at YouTube. And I kind of liked Mount School too. When I when after I got here, kind of got used to what was here and what was, what were where things were, what was going on. I thought you know it's a pretty nice town. I would have probably stayed in school, but I felt very uncomfortable. Uh, it, the the political climate here had changed so much, and people were so anti-war that I didn't feel comfortable. Knoxville, it was bad in Knoxville? Yeah, this was in, I started school in January 7th. January 1970. And uh, it, it just didn't, I didn't feel like I belonged there. I, I didn't like the attitude of the people. I didn't like the baby killer thing. Even though I was approximately still close to the age of group of people that I'm talking about, I felt like an old man in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. They were so young and full of shit that they didn't know. <laughs> yeah, and you've had so much experience that they yeah. couldn't even begin to understand. And they, and they had no idea what they were talking about. They were just, they were having uh, theoretical life is what they were doing. Mm -hmm. they, they were theorizing that life should be like this. They didn't know what life was. They didn't know what death was. They didn't know shit. Still don't. <laughs> and they, For the and most they, part. And they don't. And 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 they didn't realize how close they were to finding out. Mm -hmm. Especially those that were a little too vocal or a little too pushy to somebody who they knew to be a veteran. And we were easily identifiable. We had short hair. We had different carrier carriage. We carried ourselves differently. We were military. We didn't slump. We didn't swagger in the sense that we just walked. Mm -hmm. And then we, we didn't have, we had what they call military bearing that made us easily identifiable. Right. And some people made the mistake of saying too much and they don't know how close they came to finding out what the real life was. <laughs> by and you it, personally, right? <laughs> by me personally. And I found it, I found myself in a position I felt like I was going to hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. And I didn't need to be in that environment. So I left school. How long?